Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship today. For those of you who are, who are here, welcome, and those of you who are online, we are happy to have you joining us today. Today is the last day in the month of July, 17th Sunday in Ordinary Time. As we gather together, I have a few announcements for this morning. Uh, the first is we will be passing around a clipboard for our annual church summer picnic. Um, we, uh, it's hard to believe we've already reached the end of July. If you'd like to join us, that date is August 19th. It'll be from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, you'll have other opportunities if you're not sure yet what you're doing that day um, to sign up. You may have received a stewardship letter in the mail this past week. I want to, on behalf of the stewardship committee, thank you for the many ways in which you support Sunrise Church financially through your contributions, but also through the many hours of volunteer work you do and other ways in which you keep our church thriving. There are a few announcements in our bulletin this week in terms of calendar. A reminder that our deacons are not meeting in the summer months. They will resume the first week in September. Faith and Life is going to be meeting a week earlier than usual on August 7th. And then there's a couple of days uh, lower in the calendar there where you'll see that either I am gone or the office is closed. Um, and then a note that is in the bulletin this week, um, Sharon Hovey uh, sends her gratitude and thanks for the many uh, people who, from Sunrise who've reached out to her um, after Bud's death earlier this month. We are continuing to uh, follow where everyone is going this summer with our Flat Jesus. If you want one and don't have one, there is, are some extras out on the table with the bulletins. Um, it is wonderful to see where folks are at since so many of us travel during the summer months in Montana. A couple of people have asked um, how I get them online. Well, I click lots of buttons. Um, and just because of the way our Facebook page is set up, we've found that it is easiest if you are able to email or text it to me or to the church office and we'll put them up online for you. Um, I just put them online um, to post after I get them. So if you've sent something recently, you'll see it coming up on our Facebook page in the next week or so. Please do continue to send them. It is a wonderful way to keep track of each other these summer weeks. This is a fifth Sunday, and as part of our fifth Sunday, I have some trivia questions for you today. Um, and the first one is related to summer activities. That is this. Who owns the most sleeping bags? Is there any household here who has zero sleeping bags? Oh, we've got a couple. Okay. Who has one or more sleeping bags at your house? All right. Two. Three. Got a couple people still in, four, five. Anyone got six? Five, who dropped out at five? All right, you have a gift. <laughs> uh, the next one is, uh, if I was to compete, I think I would win this one, but I wouldn't swear to it. Who has the most Bibles? Doesn't have to be different versions, just how many do you have in your house? Last time I counted, I was at about 30. But it's a little different when you're a pastor. You have a tendency to collect them. So um, I, we will start with two. We'll assume that most folks have one in their house, even if it was a Gideon's Bible that they stole somewhere. <laughs> uh, two or more in your house. Three. Let's skip up to five. Who has five or more Bibles in your house? Six. Seven. Let's go up to ten. Oh, we've still got a, two households in the running. Eleven. Let's go up to 15. <laughs> it, I, think, I think the pastor's kid is the winner there. Okay. 
And the last one is, uh, I think I asked this probably the last two years, but who has the most produce growing in your garden? Is there produce? Who's growing a fruit and vegetable garden? Flowers are beautiful, but they don't count today. Do you have at least a couple of produce plants growing at your house this year? Okay. I know. It's a... Sometimes gardening is a lot of work. Who has an actual garden space for produce this year? Five by five or bigger? Only one household of those who are here. All right, it's the Sivak family. I love this Sunday because I get to learn more about who you are and who we are as a community together. Uh, sometimes we just don't know um, the wonderful attributes and activities of those who are around us. Let us now call ourselves to worship as we enjoy this. Oh, yes, we have an announcement. It is, yes. Thank you, Beth, for putting that arrangement together for us. Let us come into our time of worship with this morning's prelude. God calls us together as a community of faith so that we can worship together and bolster one another. Let us call ourselves to worship. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. 
Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Please rise in body or in spirit as you are able, as we join together in hymn number 41, verses 1 through 3. of heaven is for all of us, but we come to this space full of our own burdens. Let us confess our sins before our triune God. Together our prayer of confession. Holy God, we try to keep you close to us, but we push our neighbors away. We have been distracted by the things of this world and we have love from each other and from you. Have mercy on us, O oh God. In your compassion, cleanse and release us from our sins. Create in us a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within us. Amen. Who is to con condemn? It is Christ who died and who was raised, who at is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. God, you have made us in your image. Let our hearts, minds, and spirits be turned to you. May the Holy Spirit bring us closer to the word. Amen. Our first scripture this morning is found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 33 and then 44 through 50. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then his joy, he goes and he sells all that he has to buy that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea 
and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they threw it ashore, sat down, and put the good in baskets and threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We don't have any children here this morning, so we'll uh, proceed to our next hymn. Since we just sat down, let us remain seated. We'll sing hymn number 519 through two times. From the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 31 and 32. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. The readings for today are about our understanding of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. So what is the kingdom of God like? Here's your challenge. Write down in your bulletin three things that you think that the kingdom of God is like. Is there anyone who's willing or interested in sharing? What is the king, Richard, what is the kingdom of God like for you? Peace. Tranquility. Joyful. Joyful. Welcoming. Welcoming. Forever and ever. Forever and ever. Happy. Happy. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, Say that again. Uh, kind. Mm -hmm. Glorious. Glorious. Powerful. Powerful. Mm -hmm. Reuniting. Reuniting. Mm -hmm. 
So the scriptures this week are this series of very small parables that Jesus tells that are all metaphors for the kingdom of God. Now, I have to say, I had never really considered this before until I heard the professor, Matt Skinner, say, you know, it's easy since they are all together to assume that they are saying the same thing about the kingdom of God. But that might not be necessarily the answer. In fact, uh, we shouldn't assume that these parables are compatible with one another. They may be completely separate ways of understanding the kingdom of God. Or it could be talking to different groups, targeting different times in people's lives and experiences when they understand the kingdom of God. So Jesus spends actually a fair amount of time talking about what the kingdom of God looks like. So it makes sense that we should occasionally in church talk about it. I think it's hard for us to talk about it in church because how we look at and experience the kingdom of God is very different indeed. Just like these five parables give different perspectives, so we have different experiences expectations and understandings of the kingdom of God, a kingdom of heaven, based on how we are raised, the churches that we have attended, and quite often uh, portrayals and depictions that we see in media, in books, and on TV, and in movies, and um, on audio series. So today I want to look just in particular at the story of the mustard seed. These are, this whole series here, is some of Jesus' shortest parables that we find in all of scripture. And the one about the mustard seed comes closest to being the shortest at just two verses. So I want to start out by talking about daisies. When I was a child, my mother had a friend who had this beautiful garden with daisies in it. They were these, you know, sort of typical white daisies that you would find in, in a regular home garden. But my mother just thought they were quite lovely and wanted some for our house. So she got some starts from her friend and she planted them in her garden. And uh, I wish I'd, I should have put a picture up, but my mother has a a small retaining wall in her yard that uh, was put in when the lawn was flattened. It was kind of on a slope, so flattened part of it, the lawn. And the daisies were up along the top edge. Can you picture that sort of in your head? Not very tall retaining wall, probably two and a half feet, three feet. So the first year, the daisies started out and they survived. Year two, they were lovely. They had begun to really establish themselves and thrive. Year three, a few started popping up in the lawn below the retaining wall. And by year four, they were taking over the grass so badly that she was seeking ways to kill them off by any means necessary. I'm pretty sure that included my sister and I trying to pull them up by hand. And also probably the use of chemicals that are probably now banned. 10 years, from year four to year 10, it took her six years to kill off all of those daisies. And she didn't leave any in the retaining wall garden at all. They had become a blight, choking out everything else, including her grass. We'll get back to how that comes into the play of the kingdom of heaven. One of the primary things to talk about when we talk about the kingdom of heaven is where it's located. Now, the first answer we might think of is that the kingdom of God is located in heaven, because sometimes we even use this language interchangeably. I have since we started talking a few minutes ago. 
There is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And are they synonymous? That's a question. But where is the kingdom of heaven? Where would we locate it? My children believe that heaven is somewhere above the clouds and the stars. I think that's actually not a bad explanation for where the kingdom of heaven may be. But is that how Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven in this parable? I'll read it again. You can tell me if it fits with your view of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, and when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Perhaps that may fit with some of us in our understanding of the kingdom of heaven. Perhaps not. I think Jesus, in this particular parable, now there are others I think he's talking differently, but I think in this particular parable, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God in the present, in the here and now. That this is the place where the kingdom of God reigns. Not in some faraway place above the stars and the clouds and the cosmos. Not in some alternative land or universe that we cannot see but knows is real. I think Jesus in this parable is talking about the kingdom of God being here and now. You know, it seems like we don't talk about this very often, but we actually talk about it every single week. We just maybe don't recognize it as so. You see, each week we recite the Lord's Prayer. And we talk about it, right? We talk about how we understand the kingdom of God when we say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our prayer that the kingdom of God is present in the here and now. And you see, Jesus is doing something in all of these parables, which is very interesting, in that he, in his life, as he refers to the kingdom of God or the reign of God and the kingdom of heaven sometimes, that he is talking about actions that we can do now to make the kingdom of God come present here. How can we treat people? How can we act and live in a way that reflects those things that we named about the kingdom of heaven when we began? Jesus is calling for us to make this reality, that it would be powerful, that it would be beautiful, that it would be joyful, that it would have peace, that it would have happiness and harmony, that it would have justice and kindness. Jesus is calling for us to work for the kingdom of God in the here and now, that it would be present in our human activities. So why this metaphor? Why does Jesus use the mustard seed at all? What does it have to do with the kingdom of heaven or reign of God? Here's what we know about the kingdom of heaven in the mustard seed. We're probably talking about a white mustard seed, usually found in the Middle East. There are 
really three different kinds of mustard plants that grow if you are interested in such things. They can grow to be about 12 foot tall. If you have ever seen a celery seed, if you were ever cooking chicken noodle soup or something like that, a mustard seed is going to be just a little bit bigger than your average celery seed. It's not the smallest of seeds, but it is pretty tiny compared to the tree that it could grow into. I wanna say that this picture of this particular mustard tree bush is photoshopped to the max. It is usually not quite so pretty or stately or noble at all. Jesus is using hyperbole here. The mustard seed isn't the smallest seed out there and it really doesn't grow into a mighty tree. It grows into something that's more like a big and gnarly bush. It's that thing that you would chop down if it ever grew in your way on your path to your favorite fishing hole. It's not pretty. It's hardly likable as a plant. And the people who are hearing Jesus' story about that would know it. Because you see, if you got mustard in your garden, you were not going to be happy. You know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't look it up. I'll take the commentary's word for it. But um, it, I believe that in the Gospel of Matthew, it talks about instead of the mustard being in the field, that it's actually put in a garden, which makes the hyperbole even this much bigger because we don't put invasive species into our gardens unless it's something like this. It's like a noxious weed almost. Not quite, but it's heading in that direction. It's strong, it's resilient, and it spreads very easily because those teeny tiny little seeds that are not the smallest seeds are easily picked up and carried by the wind or by animals that pass by. And this is perhaps where we start to see what Jesus is getting at. That Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is like this. That the kingdom of God is strong and resilient and easily spread. It grows and once it's established, it's hard to get rid of it. Perhaps Christianity has a bit of that in it. Some scholars uh, noted, here's this, I don't know if you can read the question, or maybe you can. Um, as some scholars have noted that the particular tree in question, that is the mustard tree or, or plant, is quite invasive. And the listeners who are hearing Jesus would understand why it would not normally be planted in a garden, like in Luke. Pliny the Elder, writing around 78 CE, so about 40 years after Jesus' death, notes that the mustard tree, most likely referred to in this parable, was more like a malignant weed than a desirable flora. He writes that mustard is extremely beneficial for health. It grows entirely wild, though it is improved by being transplanted. But on the other hand, when once it has been sown, it is scarcely possible to get the place free of it. As the seed, when it falls, germinates at once. Is the kingdom of God perhaps like this? Something that once we choose to pass it on, finds root. Is it an encouragement to us that we can be people who spread the kingdom of heaven? 
even if we don't particularly like to be compared to a noxious weed. So we see the irony here. We've talked about that, that it's not the biggest tree in the literal sense. There are certainly much bigger and grander trees. It is much bigger than that tiny seed would suggest. But while it isn't large, it has multiple functions. It provides food. The leaves of the mustard plant and bush are actually edible. It provides spice and it provides shelter for birds and other small critters. And it's resilient. The professor John Carroll says this about the parable of the mustard seed being a metaphor for the kingdom of God like this. So this is an empire too, but what an improbable one. God's reign starts small, and even in its effective operation, it is no majestic towering tree. Yet it gets the job done, bringing life and help and hope to all manner of people. The church, whatever its size and resources, is still given this world-transforming mission. What Jesus talks about gives this world something that is improbable as the kingdom of God, and yet perhaps very apt in that it is alive and it is providing shelter and nourishment. So while we often think about the kingdom of heaven, the heavenly place, being the godly place where we go after we die, we can understand it in the here and now in this parable. That it gives us another way to understand the kingdom of God. The here and now kingdom of God. That we do not need to be the biggest or most majestic in order that we can grow God's kingdom and provide for God's people. There are ideal parameters, but it can grow even outside of those ideals in a variety of places and spaces, sometimes even a bit unexpected, like those daisies that went everywhere. So, perhaps this can be a definition of the kingdom of God. That the kingdom of God is like a resilient plant. It provides food and oxygen and shelter. It is not easily removed and its seeds help it to spread across the terrain. It's not the biggest, it's not the prettiest, it's not going to get best in show, but it is present and it is thriving. Even when others don't see its full worth. That's the story of the mustard seed, that it can be another way to understand the kingdom and the reign of God. May we be like the mustard seed, providing for all who come into our sphere. May God make it so.
The one who sows a small number of seeds will reap a small crop, and the one who sows a generous amount of seeds will reap a generous crop. Let us share our offering to God in support of the kingdom of heaven. Together in unison, let us prayer of thanksgiving, our offertory prayer. Generous God, in abundance you give us things, both spiritual and physical. Help us to hold tightly the fading things of this earth, and grasp tightly the lasting things of your kingdom. Make it so what we are, and do, and say, and may be our gifts to you through Christ and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please turn to him 292 as the wind song.
Please be seated. I'll start out with a few prayer concerns that uh, I have, and then I'll open it up to you. The first is continuing prayers for Dixie and Rod Peranto. Rod has now been in the hospital uh, for approximately six months at different facilities trying to recover and recuperate. And that is a long and exhausting time. Please keep both of them in your prayers. We remember this week and at the beginning of August that we have many farmers and ranchers who are out uh, harvesting crops on the roads and doing uh, the things that they do to help keep our country fed. We are in fair and rodeo season. Uh, we remember all those who are involved with the events of the summer and especially we pray for safety for all of those who are attending our fair this week. We remember that as children are out of school, while this is a joyous time for many, it can also be a time of anxiety and uncertainty for children who come from difficult homes. Please remember them in your prayers. Lastly, remember to keep in your prayers the many people in our congregations who are traveling right now. And I know some of you are traveling and we have loved ones who continue to travel our roads as well. What joys and concerns do you bring today? Yeah, Tana. Thank you. We continue to keep Ed and Lori Mackey in our prayers. Uh, Ed has started chemo. And yeah, John. Prayers for the Robinson family, specifically Adele, as she is in Salt Lake City uh, with some heart issues. Is that correct, John? Prayers for the Shearer family and baby Lennox. We hold these prayers that have been lifted up in the prayers of our heart as we come before the Lord. Oh God, we give thanks for the gift of another day, for sunshine and long summer days, for shade and sunblock. We lift up our hearts to give thanks to changing seasons through the sweetness of ice drinks and days that are gradually shortening. We give thanks for ordinary neighbors who use their gifts and talents to help others, farmers, ranchers, merchants, bakers, and all who help provide our loved ones and ourselves with nourishment. We give thanks for the everyday miracles that give us hope, such as plants growing and yeast blooming. God of grace, we offer our prayers to those in need. In this moment of prayer, we remember those who don't have the, act, the resources they need, those who are lonely and without community, those who cannot find peace in their own body or mind, those who struggle with religious trauma. Oh God, you have welcomed us into the kingdom of heaven. It is a kingdom that is beyond our understanding, but we trust that you know it just as you know us. God, let us find peace in that which we cannot know and faith to trust in your love. Hear us now as we pray the prayer Christ taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now rise in body and in spirit as we join in hymn number 749. One of the verses of that song says, we are called to be the light of the kingdom. Indeed, may we be a light in the kingdom of God, in the presence and in the here and the now. As you go away from this place today, remember that you are a beloved child of God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace.